Today for this video what I'm going to do is show you how to do a two sample t-test with independent samples and for this one we are not going to pool our data. Um, most of the time when you're going through and looking at values that are dealing with two samples and you're talking about the sample means, um, you're not going to know that you have to use the two sample t-test. So I wanna address how to know that you are going to use that, um, how to know whether you are going to pool or not pool and whether you have independent or dependent samples. So let's first read the problem and then we'll discuss all of those things. So a pet store claims that the mean annual cost for routine vet visits are the same for cats and dogs. The mean costs for random samples of the two types of pets are shown below in this table. So we have um, the sample mean for dogs is um, $252 and we're gonna use X bar one to denote that. The sample standard deviation for dogs is $28. The sample size was 20 and then cats, um, the mean annual cost was $187 with a sample standard deviation of $31 and a sample size of 24. Okay, so a couple things here. Whenever you see mean, that means that you're going to use the symbol mu when you are setting up um, your hypothesis. Anytime you see proportion or you see percentages, you're going to use P. So that's something that you need to know. Um, for this one, it tells us that the mean cost for, uh, sorry, to assume that the population is normally distributed. And it also tells us that the variances are not equal. Okay, um, so in this situation, because it says the variances are not equal, this tells us that we don't pool. The only time you pool is if you have um, equal variances and you know that they are equal. If the variances are not equal to each other, then it's very dangerous to pool and it can mess things up. So it's always better to not pool unless you are told that the variances are equal to each other. Okay, um, so the way that I know that this is a two sample t-test is first of all, I have two samples that I'm dealing with. Um, so if you have one sample, then you would use one sample t-test or one sample z-test. For this one, because we have two samples, we could either be using the z-test, the two sample z-test or the two sample t-test. And what tells us that we are going to be using the t-test is that the population standard deviations are unknown. So the population standard deviations, if they were known, then we would use a two sample Z test. But in this case, because the population standard deviations, that would be sigma one and sigma two, are unknown. I almost wrote known, even though I said unknown, are unknown. We know the sample. Okay, so if you are using a textbook that talks about both the two sample Z test and the two sample T test, that's how you tell the difference. Most of the time you're going to use the two sample T test because of the fact um, that the population standard deviation is rarely known. So this is the more common of the two tests for two sample means. Okay, um, the other thing that we have is when you have two samples, you could have dependent samples or independent samples, which will help you to know what kind of two sample test for the mean that you're going to use. In this case, cats and dogs are independent of each other. There is no overlap. One does not depend on the other. Um, so because they are independent samples, they're independent of each other, that tells us that we would use the traditional two sample t-test and not um, the dependent sample t-test. There's a lot of things that you have to know, which is why these videos are always so long. Okay, um, the other thing that we have to have to use this test are random samples. Okay, and in order for the central limit theorem to kick in, you either have to have a sample size that is greater than or equal to 30, or the population has to be normally distributed. So it says assume population is normally distributed. Okay, um, the conditions vary between textbooks. So 
make sure that you check your textbook and your class for the conditions and assumptions that you have to have. Um, one thing about teaching stats that I have found is that it's different from one textbook to the next textbook. Okay, so now that we've stated our condition, so we know what we are going to use. We are going to use the two sample t-test and this is independent samples. And I will do another video in the future that shows um, what to do if you have dependent samples, and then I will also do one where it's independent samples, but you have to pool. Um, so for this one, it's going to be not pooling because of the fact that the variances are not equal. Most of the time you are going to do um, this method over the other with the pooling. Pooling is harder to do by hand. The computations are harder to do by hand. Um, but it's dangerous to pool if the variances are not equal to each other. Okay, um, so we're gonna set up the claim as a sentence. So we have the mean, which would be mu. Um, we're saying that they are the same for each other. So that means that there is no difference between the two. Okay, the sample, we're gonna say that the population means are equal to each other. So what we have is when we're setting this up, depending upon your textbooks, again, there is differences. You could set it up as mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, which means that there is no difference between the two. Um, or more commonly, you will see it that mu1 equals mu2. You could write this out in sentence form saying that the mean annual cost for dogs equals the mean annual cost for vet care for cats. Um, but this is going to be our claim. And again, it just depends on the textbook that you're using. This is the more common one, so that's the one that I would use. Um, but I put this one down just because some textbooks write it this way. So the alternative would be the opposite, that the mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero. That means that it could be either above or below. Um, or we could say that mu1 is not equal to mu2. Again, it depends on how you have it set up. Okay, so I know that that was a lot of information, but there's always a lot of information. Once you understand this stuff, it's you go through much quicker. All right, so what we're going to do is, because of the fact that I'm doing hand calculations with this one, I'm going to use a rejection region. So I'm gonna draw out my normal curve. This one is going to be two-tailed, so I'm gonna shade both of the tails. And it's going to be on our significance level, which in this case we said was alpha equals 5%. So half of our alpha would be here, and half of our alpha would be here. So this would be our rejection region. So basically, if our value falls either in this shaded region above or the shaded region below, then we would reject. Okay, um, for this one, the rule that we use to find the degrees of freedom, since it is a T test, we do have to have the degrees of freedom. When you don't pool, it's the smaller of the sample size of N1 minus one or N2 minus one. Okay, so the first sample minus one or the um, first, the sample size of the second one minus one, depending upon which one is smaller. So in this case, because of the fact that N1 is our smaller one, our degrees of freedom would end up being 20 minus one, which ends up being 19. So to find our critical value, our T sub C or our T naught or our T star, depending upon which textbook you are using, we would go to our T table. So let me go ahead and pull that up. So I just have a T table, I'm going to look for a two tail alpha until I find 0 0.05. So I'm gonna go down this column until I find a degrees of freedom um, 19. So my degrees of freedom would be 19. I would have a two tail 0 0.05. And we would end up with 2.093. So if our standardized test statistic is greater than 2.093, So this would be our critical value, which again, depending upon your textbook, could be TC, it could be T star, um, 
or we could say that it's the negative 2.093. So if it falls either to the left of this one or to the right of this one, then we will reject. Okay, so our next thing that we wanna look at is actually how to calculate t. So t is calculated by taking x bar one minus x bar two minus the difference that we stated at the beginning. So like that's where this part comes into play more is writing it this way is because in the formula that's what you're talking about okay so since we're saying that there is no difference our mu one minus mu two would just be zero is what we would plug in for that divided by and again um this is the not pooled formula okay and like i said this one is used way more often so we're not going to pool this one so I would have S1 squared divided by N1 plus S2 squared divided by N2. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm just going to take and plug in all of those values. So I'm gonna come in and I'm going to plug in X bar one, 252 minus 187. Um, this is what I'm gonna use for S1 and S2 and then N1 and N2. So I'm just taking the information from this chart. That's where I'm getting all these values and I'm plugging them into my formula. So we would plug in the 252 minus 187, and we would put that in parentheses. And in this case, because we're saying there is no difference, we would just subtract zero. Okay, and then we would do the same thing. We would look at our table again. So again, I'm just getting the information from my table up here. S1 is 28 and S2 is 31. So we would have 28 squared divided by n1, which is 20, plus 31 squared divided by 24. So when you plug this into your calculator, you do want to be careful with this. Because it's the minus zero, I wouldn't even put that in. Okay, I would make sure that you put this entire part over parentheses, divided by n in the square root, and make sure that this entire part here is either under, under um, the radical in your calculator or you do have parentheses around the whole thing. But if you plug it into your calculator correctly, you should get approximately 7.3019. So just round to however many places that you have. So then what we would do is we would compare this to our rejection region. So basically we end up with our standardized test statistic is approximately 7.302. And then we look to see, does it fall to the right of 2.093 or to the left of this? If it does, then we reject. If it's um, between these two values, then we do not reject. So since seven is clear up here, um, it's barely shaded at all. Um, it is in the rejection region. So we would say since this is in the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to reject H sub zero. So now if we look at this, our conclusion is that we rejected um, the null hypothesis. So we're rejecting this fact that there is no difference. Okay, um, so with this, what we would say is you always wanna put it whatever level of significance so that anybody that understands um, statistics understands what level you're putting it at. So we would say at 5%. There is enough evidence to reject the pet store's claim that the mean annual cost for routine um, vet visits is the same for cats and dogs. Okay, and then what you can do is you can take this a little bit further and look to see what happens. So because of the fact that dogs is our first sample and cats is our second sample. And we ended up with a positive value. So when I did X bar one minus X bar two, that's telling us that dogs are more expensive. So from based on our sample, it 
it appears cat, um, dogs cost more than cats. So that would be an inference that you could make that based on the samples that it appears that the dog's vet visits annually cost more than the cats. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics that you need me to cover, please let me know that as well.